Howdy. It's so embarrassing that people follow me around, film me when I'm surfing and stuff. It's just, you know, I don't know. You can't get away from the paparazzi. But it's, uh, it is. It's, it's, um, it's cool to be here. Um, I have dropped in a few times uh, during the week. I came along to the final youth night uh, at the end of last year and uh, saw the job that Ben and um, Mike and the team were doing. It was phenomenal. It was really cool. It's just great to see things going on. Um, I really want to thank Craig and the leadership team for uh, inviting me back and giving me this opportunity this week and next week for part two, um, just to share what's on my heart, a little bit about where we've been. Um, so uh, yeah, it's great. It's great to, be, great to be here. You guys look great. Yeah? And it, uh, last week, I was in a little church in Tipuki, a Presbyterian church with about 30 uh, people all over 60, so my, my colleagues, and, uh, and, and it was just a lovely experience, real simple service, and this old wooden kind of Presbyterian church, and felt the presence of God there, um, and I didn't know what to expect, um, but it was just, it was lovely, and coming back here, a little bit nervous, coming back to my old hometown, um, but uh, same thing here, it doesn't matter how big you are. Uh, or how small you are, or how many lights you have, or how many lights you don't have. Uh, you just sense the presence of God amongst you. So thank you. Uh, just thank you for being here and, and stuff. So summer series, um, said thank you. Uh, our topic today, I'm going to say, uh, how many have never met me, have, ne- have not had the pleasure of meeting me? <laughs> Man, you're missing out. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna, I'll do a little introduction in a minute, but our topic today uh, is from here to there. And if you have a, a Bible with you, we're going to be put your finger in Genesis 12 uh, or in uh, Hebrews 11, in both of those. Uh, if you are going to use your phone, could you just please check the person beside you, make sure they're not texting uh, and not Googling anything that I say, uh, you know, not fact checking, all right? So you're not allowed to do that. Um, so we're, we're talking about uh, from here to there or ending up where you're supposed to be, ending up where you're supposed to be. Um, and there was... Um, there was a guy named Mike Lewis back in 1985, and I remember when this happened. It's a true story. Um, and he was flying from, um, from London on Air New Zealand to Los Angeles, and he was um, stopping in Los Angeles, and then he's flying on to Oakland, just another hour and a half. And he was tired, and they stop, and they land in L.A. Uh, it was late at night, um, and he's you know, he's tired, and, and he just follows everybody. 400 people get off the plane. They just resurface the plane, and he, and, they, and he follows them into this lounge, and he sits down, and he has a little bit of a kip, and then he hears the call, uh, the boarding call. says, uh, yeah, the flight is carrying on to uh, it's New Zealand, actually, you know, uh, carrying on to uh, Auckland. Uh, yeah, so if you're boarding the flight to Auckland, uh, and so he goes, oh, yeah, that's my flight going to Auckland. And so he jumps on the plane, and he goes to his seat, but um, there's a bit of a confusion. Somebody's in a seat, and he goes to the stewardess, and he pulls out his, his rumpled, you know, boarding pass, and they couldn't read it. They said, oh, don't worry about it. Just grab a seat. We'll, we'll sort it out later. Um, and he says, about an hour and a half, he'll be back, back home in Oakland, California. Um, and, uh, and three hours later, he wakes up, and he's still flying. And then he hears this notice that, uh, yeah, we'll be landing in Tahiti in a few hours. And, you know, he was a brilliant guy, and he was a great geography student. He goes, I don't think Tahiti is between Los Angeles and, and Oakland. So he goes up to the stewardess, and he, you know, Mike Lewis, true story. Um, hey, this plane's going to Oakland, right? She goes, oh, y- yes, it is. Kiwi accent, so forgive me, 35 years in New Zealand, still can't do a Kiwi accent. Um, um, oh, yes, sir, we're going to, to Auckland, you know. He's, oh, yeah, yeah, sweet ass, going, we're going to Oakland, right? Yes, yes, it's Auckland. And of course, you know the story. He found out that he was flying to Auckland. That's the proper way to say it. 6,600 miles out of his way. <laughs> Wrong way, Mike. He actually became a mini celebrity. Uh, he was on the Johnny Carson show, the, you know, the original Tonight Show, um, for a guy who just didn't get where he was supposed to be. Um, you know, it's like dance, you know. Dance, right? So when I ask a girl for a dance, she doesn't, never knows what I'm talking about. Um, it's a dance, a potato, potato, uh, physics, psychic, you know. Um, 
So let's, uh, let's pray and then let's, let, let's read the word. And we don't want to be like wrong way, Mike. And the whole, you know, the, the core of the message today is, um, you know, Abraham went from where he was to where he was meant to be. And we don't want to miss it. Church, you know, you don't want to miss it individually. You don't want to get on the wrong train, the wrong plane in your life. You want to end up where you're supposed to be. Uh, so let's, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Uh, thank you for this great church, Father, and, and what's gone on in the past and w- the great plans that you have for every individual, every family, uh, and for this town and for this church in the future. We thank you, God. We pray that you'll uh, take your word today and do what only your word can do, Father. Change our hearts, break our hearts, and may we all step forward today because of the hearing of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. So open up your phones. No texting. The Lord said to Abraham, uh, leave your country. Um, leave your country, your people, your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, he obeyed. And he went, and even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city and foundations whose architect and builder is God. By faith, Abraham, even though he was past age, now we've moved on to Hebrews. Sorry, that last slide and this one, we're in Hebrews 11. And by faith, Abraham, even though he was past age and Sarah herself was barren, was enabled to become a father because he considered him faithful. He considered him faithful who'd made the promise. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. May God bless the reading of his word and may that be the future of this church. Uh, and may that be your future. Uh, so from here to there, uh, just a little bit about myself for those, of, though, those who don't know me. I was born in Canada of Italian immigrants to um, central Canada around Toronto. Um, I met Jesus, went to high school there and stuff, and, and we were Catholics, but I didn't know God personally. When I was 20, um, amazing guy came into our lives, friend of my brother's, and he led my whole family came to Christ. I was praying for that when I was like six years old, I can still remember saying, if you're there, uh, if there's a heaven, man, I'd love to be there. And my mom and dad and my brother, my sister and my brothers. And, and that prayer was answered. Isn't God great? Um, and this guy came into my lives I, and I became a Christian. When I was a kid, I had a, a, I'd watch these movies of guys that would come into ghetto schools and, and went over these troubled kids. You know, there was a, an old movie called Blackboard Jungle with Victor Morrow and Sidney Poitier. And I, and I was like a little kid. I said, that's what I want to do with my life. And I, I wasn't a Christian, uh, but I just said, man, that's the coolest thing in the world, helping out these young people. Even though I was like seven and the young people were like 16, I wanted to help these young people. Now I'm like 80 and the young people are, you know, 16. So, and uh and so, uh, so yeah, I became a Christian. Went to Bible College, Tyndale Bible College in Toronto. Uh, uh, graduated out of there uh, in 82, 83. Um, I wasn't quite ready to, to get into the real world, so I felt the Lord calling me to ski for five years. <clears throat> <clears throat> so I moved out to a beautiful place called Banff, Alberta. Who's been there? Who's seen it? Unbelievable place, like, like Queenstown. And lived there for five years, praying to meet, you know, a girl that would deserve me. And... Um, and, and she, she appeared exactly what I'd been praying for. And we were married, uh, came back to her hometown, Makatu. And, uh, you know, yeah, oh, you can tell I've been eating those meat pies. Eh? And, uh, and we, um, yeah, so, and, and, you know, I was praying for, you know, I always wanted to serve God and started working at Tupuki Baptist Church as a youth pastor, uh, as, as helping volunteer youth pastor in 1989. And I stayed there for 18 years. Um, that's right. Rob will tell you, Rob Stacy, good to see Rob. Give Rob a clap, hey, I, you know. I don't know if you know this guy. I've, I've known Rob for years in the youth pastor circuits. And uh, just a word of warning, don't listen. Keep an eye on this guy, all right? You know, very dangerous. Um, but it's good to see him, man. And um, 
Uh, yeah, so youth pastor there, and uh, yeah, I was a legend in my own mind because I stayed at that same job. I was too stupid to quit, and I stayed there for 18 years and had, a, had a, just a ton of fun and, and uh, serving God and saw that ministry grow. And then we went, Briar and I were praying, and we decided to go back to Canada for two years to be with my, my dad had passed away, and we spent two wonderful years with my mom and my brothers uh, over on the west coast of Canada. Um, and came back here just saying, oh man, am I too old? I, I don't want to be a, I don't want to step down to being a pastor. You know, I want to, but I'm too old. Surely I'm too old to be a, a youth pastor. I was in my 50s and I got a call from Ross Horton from this church and he said, hey, can you help us for, you know, we just need an interim youth pastor. And I, I said, yep, I'll come for three months. Seven years later, uh, just had a blast. Uh, and really, I mean, you know, not, to, not disparaging on anywhere else where I've worked, Really, the seven best years of ministry of my life. It's, I love this church. Give yourselves a hand. Um, it really was. Um, finished up there, and then, and then my wife and I, um, we've just been planning this for our whole lives. So I had a big birthday, a 40-ish year old birthday. And, uh, and so we did this trip. Um, and you can't really see it too clearly, but I, and this, this is my from here to there. And Briar and I, it's our from here to there. Uh, she went back to her roots. So Cornwall, she's got some of her family. Cor- who's been to Cornwall, England? You know, I just, I, I had no idea. I, I, I just wanted to get through England and get to Italy, right? The center of the universe. And, uh, and I thought, you know, England, it's smokestacks and concrete and Man, Cornwall is beautiful. So Briar connected with her roots. Then we went to Scotland, and she found the Crichton Castle, um, which is her, the other side of her family. Uh, and the Crichton Castle, it wasn't one of those fancy tourist jobs. It was out in a field. It was a rainy day. It, I mean, it looked like the real deal. I thought some knights would come out, cut our heads off. And, uh, and Briar, uh, you know, Briar goes up, and there's only one little tourist guy there, you know, give us a couple pence to go look around. And it was beautiful, this red, uh, this tan kind of brick thing, massive thing. And she gets to the front door and, and tells the guy, get out. I'm, this is my castle. And I went to Switzerland, and just amazing trip uh, where my mom and dad met. Uh, so after the war, they went to Switzerland. They, they, they met there, got married there, came to Canada. Um, that little town there that you can barely see, that's Ponte di Legno, where I, my whole life I've heard about this town. Uh, this beautiful little ski town nestled in the mountains where my dad used to go skiing. So we spent two or three wonderful days there. I uh, went to, did a beautiful trip across the States visiting our kids. And so it's a little bit of here to there and, and, and uh, for us. Um, in this little church, this, in, in my dad's town still has only about a thousand people, Capriolo in Northern Italy, uh, just right, on the, 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 on, right at the foot of a valley going straight up to the Italian Swiss Alps. And there's this little church um, and, uh, and, and there was this beautiful angel uh, carving. And I just snapped the picture because it really captivated me. Um, and, um, uh, and, and then there was this painting of this guy up in, 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 the, in the dome. Now, when I say it's a little church, um, you know, and, and not putting down New Zealand, but you go to a little town and there's a little church, it'll be like a little wooden structure, right? Um, and this little church here of a little town of a thousand people was absolutely beautiful. Like a mini basilica, like St. Peter's. It's just marble floors and just amazing statues. And we were, we were blown away by, um, you know, and, you know, whether it's, you know, we don't know where the people's hearts are at, but the amount, the, the work and the effort that people for hundreds of years, thousands of years have put into trying to worship God, we were flabbergasted, never got sick of it, and saw this painting. And I snapped a couple of pictures. I said, Man, that's my favorite painting. This, this beautiful, in my dad's hometown, this beautiful colors, lion behind the guy. It's St. Mark long hair, and he's holding this book. And uh, we'll, get, we'll come back to that. But traveling is amazing, isn't it? Who loves to travel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and, uh, and again, you know, we're talking about uh, Abraham, a physical journey. We're going to look at three things um, that moved uh, Abraham from here to there. And he took a physical journey, uh, as we did uh, over the last year. Uh, but as well, it's a spiritual journey that God has to move us from here to there spiritually. Changes have to be made. So we're going to be looking at that. So, and, and, and traveling is a wonderful experience. So again, hands up if you love to travel. Yeah? That, now, I, you know, either you're asleep or you don't love to travel. Who doesn't love to travel? Is there anybody? There was a few. Yeah, there's a few hands. That's, that's interesting because you guys are probably right because the word travel comes from um, a Middle English word, uh, travelian, and it means it's torment. And 
and labor and strife, and some of us experience that, um, strenuously. And, it's, and there's another word, there's a French word connected, you know, how all those words amalgamate to our, our present words, and it's torture. It's actually the word for torture. Um, and it comes to our word of travel because travel wasn't fun back in the day. You didn't travel for fun. You know, you traveled because you were running away from the Vikings. Any Vikings here? Um, you know, you were trying to escape or there's robbers and, and life was dangerous and, li- you know, life was tough. So travel wasn't fun. And we're going to do a little poll now to see how much fun you've had traveling. So I like to get people exhausted before, uh, uh, involved before, <laughs> am I exhausting you? Uh, involved before I put you to sleep when I start preaching. Um, so, uh, okay, so uh, stand up if these are true of you. And don't sit down until I say the next one. If the second one is true of you, stay standing. Uh, In the first service, there was, well, I'll tell you at the end uh, because you'll you'll get an idea where we're going. So if you've ever been traveling and you've returned home exhausted, more tired than when you left, um, stand up. So be honest, all right? You got to be honest there. Look at you, okay? Uh, Have you ever missed a flight, a bus trip, or a train trip? Uh, Stay standing. If you've ever missed a flight, oh, look at that, time. See, that's white angle Saxon Protestants. You know, you guys, you know what a watch and a calendar is, and you, you know, you, you get the things on time. Italian guy over here, I've missed about 100 flights. Um, no, not true. Have you ever lost, okay, stay standing if you've lost a passport. Okay, oh, a lot of you sat down there. <laughs> yeah. Now, I'll tell you now, we had a guy in the first service. Are you standing, sir? Because... Or are you working? Are you trying to do the technical stuff? Okay. <laughs> so uh, we had a guy in the first service who never sat down <laughs> throughout this whole horrible, sad litany. Uh, so if you've ever been robbed, stay standing. <laughs> All right, there's a few of you. Um, have you ever been sick? Now stand up. Have you ever gone traveling and you've come home sick or you got sick? Come on. Oh, there you go. There you go. Don't get lazy on me. Um, Have you ever ended up in the wrong place, like wrong way, Mike? Um, But the question is, would you do it again? So if, you know, we've all had a few problems traveling, uh, would you go, if if I could offer you uh, a month off to go traveling this year, would you want to go? Stand up. All right. Why do we do this? Give yourselves a hand. Thank you. Sit down. So we're looking at Abraham, and he was a, he was a traveler. He ended up traveling. And, and um, in one way that he traveled, um, as we start getting into this, so we're in Genesis uh, 12, and we're introduced to this character, Abraham. And one way that he traveled, well, you know, he went from rags to riches in a sense. I mean, when we first meet him, he's an unknown um, God. He's, a, you know, he's an obscure guy. He's in this lineage, this long line that goes back to the time of the flood in Genesis 11. Um, and, um, and, you know, he's one of three brothers. His dad's name is Terah. And he's living in Mesopotamia. So he's living in, in uh, just north, right at the northern tip of the Persian Gulf, pretty much on the, the boundary between Iraq and Iran. Um, and that's where he grows up. Miles from, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a moon worshiping. Ur of the Chaldees was the city. It was, a, it was a port city. And they worshiped the moon. And, you know, you would think that he was just miles away from God. Uh, and there he was, and, and uh, in the course of the story, and if you come back next week, we're going we're gonna to look at, at where he goes to. But in the course of that story, it was 2,166 years before Christ, so he's in the, the dim fog of history. And Abraham somehow becomes one of the central characters in the human story. So the three, three of the main religions, Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, honor and recognize the name of Abraham. How do you go? How do you go from here to there? How does a a sort of a farmer um, guy subsisting down there in the Ur of the Chaldees in a pagan culture, how does he he go from there to to becoming a personage who is known all throughout the world? Four billion people on the planet know the name of Abraham. So that's what we want to look at. How did he go from here to there? And the first thing, uh, as we see in that passage, um, it says in Genesis 12 that God called Abraham. And this is where it begins. God called Abraham. That word called um, in the Old and the New Testament appears more than 760 times. 
It's not always God calling, but the calling out of people, the invitation to people. Over 760 times. There's 13 different Greek words describing different ways of calling. And the word in this uh, section here, when you get to Hebrews 11, um, the, um, the, the exposition of Genesis 12 by the writer of the Hebrews, in Hebrews 11, and he says that God called Abraham, even though Abraham didn't know where he was going, by faith, Abraham went. And the word there um, is a word that, um, uh, and this is what it says about that word, that it's, it's an invitation or a summons, and the authority of the speaker dictates the nature of the calling. So the authority of the speaker, it, you have to look at the context of that word, and the authority of the speaker dictates the nature of the calling. So if it was a friend inviting a friend, it's an invitation. It was like, I'll invite you guys. Why don't you all come to my place for lunch after the service? So Briar, uh, we're just going to need some meat pies and some sausages. Um, I can invite you to come to my place. But if it's a personage of dignity, if it's a king, then it's a summons. And, and so the, the, um, the meaning in the story is that, that the God of the universe, the creator of the universe, universe summoned, called Abraham, a significant moment in his life. And I've often wondered, you know, how could God reach this person who's, who's in a pagan culture? And haven't you, and this is a problem that's intrigued me right since I first became a Christian, it's, 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 it's eaten away at me, because people will always say, well, you know, if you Christians are right, if there's, if there's the only one way to God through Jesus Christ, um, so how about, you know, have you, how many of you have heard this question? How about all the thousands of people that have lived far away in the darkness? Who's heard that question from you know, what happens to them? Do they all go to hell? We've all heard that question, right? And it, and it actually bugged me. And, and this passage really helped me to clarify when I started to study it, thinking that Abraham and Terah, his father, uh, were far from any reality, any presence of God. And then I started looking into the previous chapter where it gives the, the genealogy from Noah, his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, down to Abraham. And it gives the years between the births of all the kids that lead to Abraham. And I, and I had this mind-blowing revelation. Uh, because Shem's way, way back at the flood. Abraham's right up here at the beginning of the patriarchal history in the Bible. But you know what? Shem was still alive when Abraham was called. Now, who knew that? Who didn't know that? There's a smart Bible college student. Isn't that a surprise? Shem, the son of Noah, was still alive when Abraham, because he lived 500 years after he had his first son, Aphraxid. Yeah? So who didn't know that? Is that, put your hand, yeah, just, you know, stay with me here. You know, yell, shout hallelujah or something. No, you don't have to. Um, um, but here's the kicker. This is, here's the kicker. You know who else was alive when Abraham was called? Noah was still alive. Did you know that? So Noah, uh, uh, Abraham wasn't far from God at all, was he? Because he had two of the great names in the Bible living nearby, and he would have heard the stories of the flood, and he would have known the God of Israel, and then the God of Israel called him. So my point here is, I wonder how close or how far you are feeling today from the creator of the universe. And I wonder if you're feeling obscure and unknown, just one grain of sand amongst a trillion grains of sand on a beach. Nobody knows you. You're just hidden away. Your life is insignificant. And you're just going to get through this life. You're a nobody. I wonder how many of you are feeling that way. And Abraham was in, in the hands of God. And Paul says when he's preaching to the Athenians in the book of Acts in, in chapter 17, he says that in God, we live and move and we have our being. We are never far from God. Amen? And God was, God was near Abraham. He knew and and. I've been saying Abraham, but his name was Abram, which means holy father. And as the story progresses, his name, God changes his name to Abraham, the father of nations. So he's already a pretty good guy like you are and like I am. You know, you know I call myself a holy father all the time. And uh, so he's a holy father, Abram. But then as he, as he answers the call, he becomes the father of nations. His destiny. And God is, 
You're not far from God. You're not obscure. He knows your name today. No matter how far along you are as a Christian or you may be here and you're just looking into this, God knows your name. He knows where you've come from. He knows everything about you and he's calling you today. And as you can see up there, that list of names, um, after Adam and Eve fell in the garden in Genesis chapter three, uh, what's the first thing God did? He went for a walk in the garden. Creation is destroyed. They've rebelled against them. The, The relationship is ruined and God calls Adam by name. Adam, where are you? He went looking for him. Samuel, God spoke to him in the night and changed the nations through the prophet Samuel. Moses, when they were enslaved in Egypt, God called Moses through the burning bush. David, when they needed a hero, when Israel needed a hero to defeat a giant, God spoke to a shepherd boy and called him. God's always calling. Call the 12 apostles. He's calling this church. We can't stay where we are, church. We're a great church. BBC is a wonderful church, but we can't stay where we are because God is calling us on. The call of God. Secondly, I just have to rush through this. Um, and, it's not the, and this is the thing. You may feel distant from God and you may feel obscure because of, not because God's not near, but because you're not near him because of some sin, because of something you're struggling with. And you know that you're not worthy of God. But this is what Jesus said. It is not the, the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick And I have not come to call the righteous, but to call sinners in repentance. So that's why I can stand here knowing all the faults that I have and all the problems I have. I know that uh, Jesus, God doesn't, he doesn't come for the shining, bright, righteous guys. He comes for guys like me and he comes for people like you. So he's calling you. So um, secondly, the command to leave. Um, And just really quickly, when God calls, there's something that, have, that has to be left behind. I mean, it's just logical, but it's also very spiritual. When God calls you and you hear his voice, and remember, you, you have to be attentive to his voice. Um, you have to open your heart and you have to open your ears. And, and he's always calling. His call is constant. It's compassionate. And it's compelling. He'll compel you to change locations. But you have to open your ears. And once you've heard that voice then what you'll hear is something needs to be left behind. Abraham had to leave his country, his people, and his family. He had to basically step out of his comfort zone. And so if you're going to hear God's voice and respond, he will ask you to leave something behind. Um, and that could be physical. He could be calling you to be a missionary in the deepest, darkest Makatu. Talk to me later. Um, so it could be physical. He could be asking you to go to another church, to go to another town, um, change jobs. Leave some people behind, but, all, but often it's spiritual to leave something spiritually, to eradicate something from your life, that, that, like an idol, something that's holding you back, something that has, that, that has bound you, something that you're chained to, and he's asking you to leave it, leave it. And us humans, we naturally don't like to let things go. We sang it before, let go and trust in him. Let go and trust in him. So we have to leave something behind. Um, uh, my daughter, when she was five and my son was three, where uh, my wife was at a Bible study in Tipuki, um, and they got into, a, you know, while they were having the Bible study, the kids got into a, a lady's handbag and it had some antidepressants in there. And the kids, five kids, were eating these antidepressants. And, and, and my, you know, my wife just said, oh, I wonder how the kids are, and saw all this pink around my little three-year-old son's lips. And she says, oh, you know, what's going on? They found out it was these, these pills straight down to the doctors. The doctors put them on an ambulance and straight, you know, straight to Tauranga Hospital, five and three years old with a couple of other kids. And, um, and um, my, um, uh, they give EpiCat to the children, and they all threw up except for my daughter, Bracia. She's very stubborn. She's 30 now. <laughs> She's 30. And... Um, she, uh, she doesn't throw up. And we're in the ambulance and so she's going deeper and deeper into sleep. They hook her up to all these monitors and things and she's sinking into, a, you know, I guess it's a coma. She's, she's not responding to pinching or anything. And, um, and I'm there in this ambulance just, just going, this is, you know, my first daughter. She's only five. And, and I'm just like, you know, God, don't, you can't do this. I'm a pastor. You know, I, I preach this stuff. You got to serve God. You got to give everything away. Rich young ruler, you know, leave everything and follow me. And I, and, I, and I preached the stuff, and here I was, God, you can't do this. Can't take my daughter. And, and as we rode in the back of that ambulance, you know, a miracle really, because, you know, I'm panicking, and this great peace came upon me, this quietness, and I, 
you know, literally I heard the voice of God or I sensed the voice of God just saying to me, Albs, you know, you're following after me. You're serving me. Are you willing to allow me to take your daughter? Are, would you be willing? And, and, I, and I, I, everything got real quiet in my heart, rushing away, and the sirens going, and I, you know, would you be willing? And, and I just, and I said, yeah. Everything got quiet. I said, yeah, yeah. I'd hate it. it. You know, I'd probably be in a psych ward for a few decades, but yeah. But I'd be willing, God, because yeah, that's, what, that's my deal. When I followed you, when I said I'm following you, nothing on this earth will hold me. So yeah, I'd be willing. And, um, you know, kept going about another 10 seconds. My daughter rolls over on the, be- on the bed and spews out all this stuff all over the ambulance. It's the greatest spew I've ever seen. <laughs> He didn't take her, but he challenged me, tested me. And, and as he'll test you, are you willing? The last one is um, Abraham was given the command to go. So he had to leave and he had to go. Uh, go to the land that I will show you. By faith, Abraham in Hebrews, by faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place that he would later receive as his inheritance, he obeyed and he went, even though he did not know where he was going. And the final point I want to make um, is this, that, you know, when God calls us to go. Um, most of us humans, it's natural. We want to know where. And you can see it in the, in the New Testament when, um, I'm going to go backwards here. Sorry. When a teacher of the law came to him. So when, when Jesus is calling people to follow him, when a teacher of the law came to him, he said, teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And the point is, and Jesus picked this up. I, I, don't, I didn't pick it up reading it, but Jesus picked up, ah, he's interested in where he's going, what he's going to get out of it. And, Jesus, and he says, I'll, I'll, go, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to rest his head. And the, the short answer is that God is calling you to himself. God's calling you to leave behind, spiritually to leave behind anything that ties you to this earth because we're only passing through. And he's calling you to the only thing that's eternal, the only thing that, that, that will last, and that's himself. He's not calling you to a career. He's not calling you to a ministry. He's not calling you to people or a place. He's not calling you to be famous or rich. He's calling you to himself. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High He who dwells in the house of the Most High. He who makes the Most High his everything. He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will rest in the shadow of the Almighty. So just in closing, and uh, if I can have the the musicians can come forward. Um, Thomas said to him, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? And Jesus answered, and this is this, this great verse, um, which it would be great for this to be a life verse for all of us. Jesus said, Thomas is again thinking of a destination. Maybe he's thinking of a career. Uh, as, as we all do, us humans, it's hard to get ourselves out of the picture and to focus on God and others. Isn't it? Isn't it? Do you find that difficult? We often have ourselves at the, at the, at, on center stage in our heart's story. And Jesus said, um, Thomas said, I don't know the way. And Jesus said, I am the way. A person is the way. A person is your future, not a place, not a career. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. You know, back to that painting. Um, so we saw this painting. I loved it. You know, and it's, it's in the town of my dad's. This is where my dad grew up like 80, 90 years ago. I could see my dad running through the cobblestone streets. It's this cute little town. Took, went into the church. Wow, what a church. My dad probably came to church here. Took a picture of that guy. Went back wandering around the streets. And then my cousin found us, Briar and I, and dragged us back to the church. He said, I want to show you some stuff. Uh, we've already been in the church. Um, oh, yeah, but I want to show you some stuff. And we went in. And I looked up. And, uh, and she said, see that painting up there? Yeah, yeah, yeah I love that painting. I, look, I took this picture. Um, that's the best painting I've seen in Italy. She goes, your great-great-grandfather posed for that painting. Yeah. Unbelievable. He was a, a military officer in Bergamo 
and he retired in Capriola, and that was him on that wall. Just a, just a little picture of where I, where I come from spiritually, where God started calling my family, led to me. And then we walked out the door, and the angel you saw at the beginning, that beautiful carved angel, uh, and, and she says, oh, oh, just as I was stepping outside, she says, oh, see these angels? And there's just amazing carving, wooden carving. Your, your, uh, your grandfather carved those angels from here to there. So the message today is, you know, God called Abraham, and he's always calling. He loves you. You can always hear his voice. He's asking you to leave something this morning, and he's asking you to go somewhere, whether it's physical or spiritual. Don't be like wrong way Mike, who missed his flight, ended up in the wrong place. Amen? Don't you want to end up where God wants you to be? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for, uh, for your word, and thank you for Abraham. Thank you for the, the message today. Father, pray for each one of us. Do whatever you have to do to each one of us so we end up where you want us to be in Jesus' name. Amen.